Well, good morning, everyone. We are continuing with our series, Daniel's Visions. We're almost done with it. Uh, praise God. <laughs> it's been a very difficult uh, series of messages, but it's been also an enriching one. It's also given me, even though I've been preaching for over 30 years, it's been given me a, a fresh appreciation of the Bible that we hold so near and dear to our hearts and the veracity of it, how, how we could totally rely on what it says and we could um, stake our eternal destiny on the truths that are found in scriptures. Amen. So we have looked at the vision of the four beasts. Uh, we have said that in the first half of Daniel, the kings were having these dreams and it was Daniel who was the expert. It was Daniel who was interpreting the dreams. But beginning with chapter 7, uh, Daniel began to have these dreams, and he couldn't interpret it. In fact, he had to pray uh, several times that God will reveal to him the details of what is yet to come for his people Israel. In uh, chapter 2, we find King Nebuchadnezzar having this vision of a statue. And in chapter 7, Daniel sees the same thing, but instead of parts of the statues, he sees animals, he sees beasts. And so to represent the golden head, the Babylonian kingdom, he saw a lion with wings. To represent the Medo-Persian empire, he saw a bear with one side higher than the other to represent the silver um, chest and arms. Uh, the Greek empire, uh, the torso and the, and the thighs, was represented by a leopard, the Greek empire, and a leopard that had four, four heads. And finally, the last empire, the Roman Empire, represented by this beast with ten horns. Um, in the vision of the ram and goats, we said that we are comforted by the truth of God's word, proven by the accuracy of prophecy. And again, he sees another vision, but this time in chapter 8, he just, it just focuses on the two middle kingdoms. Instead of a bear, he sees a ram with one horn larger than the other, uh, representing, of course, the fact that it was the Persian Empire that became prominent. You know, much like the bear had one side higher than the other, it's the same thing with the ram. And then instead of a leopard with four heads, he saw a goat uh, that was uh, flying, that was just running so fast you can't even see his feet on the ground. And it, uh, of course, represented um, Alexander the Great. And his empire and that one big horn was divided into, was broken, and it, there were, in place of it were four horns. And we said that after that, we, he, he received another vision. His third vision was the vision of the 77s. What is that about? It, God reveals to him the 490 years that were, that were allocated for Israel. And it, it shows him that there is a plan by God for his, for his nation. Last week, we looked at the vision of the heavenly messenger, and we said that it was as if uh, Daniel or Gabriel sprayed luminol uh, across the sky, and just like luminol reveals things that are invisible to our eyes, you know, the blood that was, that was spilled in a violent encounter, uh, it glows in the dark when you turn off the lights. In the same way, God reveals to us things that are otherwise invisible. He revealed to us the spiritual battle in the heavenlies that are as real as this pulpit, but otherwise we could not see it. And we, we are comforted by the fact that it is God who's in control of these angelic beings and, these, and, the, and the spiritual battle that goes on. Now, in our text today, um, let me give you a brief outline because as we look into it, if we go straight into the details, you're going to get lost. And so let me just give you a broad outline of where we're gonna, what we're going to talk about. Because this is part of Daniel's fourth vision. And this fourth vision spans from chapter 10 last week to chapter 11 today to chapter 12 next week. So it's, it's three chapters of this one vision. And just our text today has 45 verses this, this chapter, I, I was kidding around. I said, I'm just going to read 45 verses, and then we're just going to close in prayer. Because that's what we all have time for. <laughs> but I'm going to summarize a lot of it, so hopefully we can get out of here before lunchtime. But uh, the, the, two, uh, the two big divisions in chapter 11 and chapter 12 are the prophecies that have already been fulfilled. In other words, from Daniel's perspective, all of this was still future. 
But from our perspective, there are prophecies that were given that's history. That's why I call it the history of the second and third kingdom. It's already happened. It's already been fulfilled. But there are prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled, talking about the times of the end, talking about the last seven years of Daniel's 77s, uh, which is the tribulation period. And we're going to talk about that next week, prophecies yet to be fulfilled. Now, let me break this down. This is chapter 11. This is the, the last part of 11, what we read today, and part of chapter 12. Now, today, what we'll be talking about are the, is history. From our perspective, history. From Daniel's perspective, still future. The angel Gabriel gives Daniel even more details because Daniel kept praying. And so he, he again, expands on the vision of the ram, which is the Medo-Persian empire. He expands on the vision of the goat, which is the Greek empire. If you recall, that empire was divided up into four when Alexander the Great died. And two of those four generals kept fighting each other. This is uh, what's given in verse 5 to verse 20. Out of Syria, out of the kingdom of the north, or out of the, the king of the north, um, is a man called Antiochus Epiphanes, and he is featured in, in um, verse 21 to verse 35. Next week, we'll talk about the tribulation and the Antichrist, the promised kingdom, and then the final instructions to Daniel. So those are prophecies yet to be fulfilled, but today, we will simply look at prophecies already fulfilled. So do you, you get where I'm going? Yes. Yeah. Um, got it? Say, got it. Got it. Okay, good. <laughs> but before we do that, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we, we approach this text, Lord, in awe of your sovereignty over nations, over times, particularly over your, the nation Israel. And we ask, Father, that your spirit would illumine our, our hearts and our minds, that we would not only understand, that we would leave this place renewed and refreshed and challenged, Lord, uh, to serve you even more. We pray that your spirit would take over, that you would uh, open eyes and hearts for these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys ready for a quiz now? Yes? <laughs> no? <laughs> Here's the question. Here's the, the quiz question. And think about it and then turn to the, your neighbor next to you and, and give the answer. So if, here's the question. If angels and demons don't die, what is at stake during spiritual warfare? If they don't die, if they're immortal and they're fighting, how do you know who's winning? What is at stake? Now turn to your neighbor and, and just give what you think. Okay, so it's okay. Uh, I, I give second chances, so go ahead and talk to your neighbor and just, go ahead, go turn to your neighbor and just, what do you think? What do you think is at stake during spiritual warfare? All right. You guys ready to answer? Now, if, if you attended the first service, okay, don't answer because that's not, that's not fair. You know the answer. But what are some of the answers you came up with on this side? What is at stake? Huh? Anyone? Just, just yell it out. What? Huh? Oh. Us? Okay, us. Somebody said us. We are at stake. Uh, what about here? Any, any, what is at stake in this war? Yes? Okay, so the influence on, on nations. Okay, what else? Yes? Fighting for our souls. Yeah, so... Influence, our souls, you know, those are all good answers. But let me summarize it all. Let me wrap it up into one, one overall, overarching theme. Why is there spiritual warfare? You know what it is? It's the glory of God. What are they fighting for? The glory of God. The battle was and is and always will, will be about God's glory. Who is worshipped in this universe? If you remember... The reason why all this spiritual warfare went on is because Lucifer fell. Why did he fall? Because he, he wasn't content in worshiping God. He wanted to be worshipped. And so in, Ephesians, in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, it says, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. 
how you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, now notice the five I will statement in Satan's heart. I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Satan didn't want to serve in front of the throne. He wanted to sit on the throne. And ever since then, the battle has always been the, about the glory of God. Who, who gets worship? He, Satan wanted to be worshipped. He wanted to grab God's glory. What did God say? Nope. No way. In Isaiah 42, verse 8, God says, I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to what? To no other. My glory I give to no other. The glory of worship is one that belongs solely to God. And he will not share the credit. He will not share the accolades with anyone else. He says, I will share my glory with no others. In our text last week, we ended by, by us God revealing the invisible and the fight that goes on in the heavenlies. It says in Daniel 10, 20, just so that we could get a running start into our text. It says, then he said, do you know why I have come to you? This is Gabriel speaking to Daniel and the fact that he was delayed uh, for weeks because, or for three weeks because he was opposed by the, the demonic force that's in charge of Persia. It says, now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. So there's a fight going on. And these are demonic forces and angelic beings that are assigned to nations to influence them. That's why I said last week, you need to, we need to pray for our nations. Why? Because there are demonic forces that want to influence the White House. There are demonic forces that want to influence the Supreme Court and the Congress. That's why we need to pray. And so it says here, behold, I, I, I'm going back to the fight, and there's another demonic force that is influencing Greece that will come. In verse 21, but I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. And so here, Gabriel, in answer to Daniel's prayer, reveals in detail what's to come. And this is from God. Only God knows everything. And so he, he reveals what is in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. So Michael, the archangel, is the one who is in charge of protecting Israel. It is this fight that has gone on in the past and a fight that will go on into the future that is spoken of in Revelation 12, 7. Now war arose in heaven. We'll, we'll talk about this a little bit next week. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. Talking about Satan, of course. And the dragon and his angels fought back. The, this, this warfare that's gone, gone on for millennia is always about one thing. It's about the glory of God. Here in our passage, going to verse 1, Gabriel says, I, I, I have, I'm going back into the fight because I need to influence the Darius the Mede. As for me, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. So it's either confirm. Uh, strengthening Darius, or it is strengthening, if the hymn refers to, um, to Michael, that we need to work together to make sure that this king is able to make decrees that will help the people of Israel. In this passage, there are three ways that God demonstrates his glory. Three things that we need to praise him for. First of all, we need to praise him because he's in control of preparing the way for the gospel. Um, the war in the heaven was about influencing events on earth for the sake of the gospel. Gabriel helped Michael to fight for Israel. And what God had in view in all these events is laying down the foundation for the good news that Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and the third day rose again. How, how does that come about? Let's look at the passage. First of all, in verse 1, he says, In the first year of Darius the Mede. Who is Darius? Darius is the one that took over after the Babylonian Empire fell. And it was Darius, under Darius' reign, that the prophecy of Jeremiah that says 
that the time of captivity shall be 70 years, it was Darius who made a decree allowing the people of Israel to go back. Now, why is that important? Because it's through the nation Israel that Messiah will be born. And it's through Messiah, his sacrifice on the cross, that we can be saved. Uh, The American commentary by uh, Stephen uh, Miller says this, Knowing that such a development could lead to the ultimate appearance of the Son of God, As the Messiah for God's redeemed, Satan and all his hosts were determined to thwart the renewal of Israel and the deliverance of its people from destruction. Why does Satan want to destroy the people of God? Because all the way back in the garden, it was prophesied that there was a seed that's going to be born. And through this seed, there's coming a son who would crush the head of Satan. So in order to prevent that, Satan has been working overtime to destroy the nation Israel. In verse 2, it says, And now I will show you the truth. Behold, three more kings shall arise in Persia, and a fourth shall be far richer than all of them. And when he has become strong through his riches, he shall stir up all against the kingdom of Greece." So after Babylon was the Medo-Persian Empire, after the Medo-Persian Empire was the Greek Empire. Now, going back to the Medo-Persian Empire, according to Gabriel, there will be four more kings that will come in this empire. Uh, It'll be Cambus, uh, Pseudo-Smyrtus in 522, Darius in 521, and Xerxes in 485 to 465. That's if you read history It was fulfilled. These are four kings that came. And this last one was going to be very rich, very influential. And it is this king that will attack Greece. And it was because of that that Daniel comes, or that um, Alexander goes back with a vengeance and attacks this kingdom and puts an end to it. Okay, what else is important about this last king? This is the king that is introduced in the book of Esther. In the book of Esther, he is called Ahasuerus. And it was this king that saved Israel from being destroyed. Remember, uh, if you read the story of Esther, uh, Haman wanted to destroy Israel. And it was Esther who appealed to Xerxes. And it it was Xerxes who gave the command for the nation Israel to be able to defend herself. And so whenever you see all these prophecies, all of it, boils down to the fact that God is preserving his nation through whom Messiah will come. Here's another thing that happens. Um, In verse 2, like I said, it was Xerxes who stir up all against the kingdom of Greece. He attacked Greece, and Alexander never forgave him for it, and Alexander comes back and destroys the Persian Empire. Okay. In verse 3, it begins to talk about Alexander the Great. It says, then a mighty king shall arise from the Greek empire who shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. And as soon as he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not his posterity. In other words, Alexander's the great kingdom, uh, he died at an early age. He died when he was only 32. And his kingdom was not given to his sons or to his, the people uh, that he had uh, was from, from him. It was given to his generals. Uh, there were four of them. It was the four winds of heaven, but not to his posterity, not to his sons, not to his children, nor according to the authority with which he ruled. In other words, these kingdoms that, were, that will arise, they'll be weaker than the Greek empire under Alexander. Says, For his kingdom shall be plucked up and go to others besides these. So if you remember, Alexander the Great, he conquered the known world very swiftly. That's why it's, they use a, a leopard, they use a, a goat that was running really fast. But after 10 years, or when he was 32, he died, and then his kingdom was divided up by, with uh, the four generals that are under him. They divided up his kingdom. Uh, Seleucus in, in Syria or in the north, Ptolemy in Egypt in the south, Cassander and 
Lysimachus in the West. Um, why is that important? Why is it important that, why does he mention Alexander the Great? Well, it's important because the Bible tells us in Galatians 4.29 that just at that time, or just at the right time, Messiah was born. The significance of Alexander the Great taking over the world is that he unified the language. Before then, everyone spoke their own language. In order for you to do business, you have to learn other language. You need to have a translator. But after Alexander the Great, one of the things that happened was his soldiers intermarried with other nations, and it became, Greek became, Greece became like a melting pot. And the Greek language was the one that was spoken. How, how is that important? It's important because when Jesus was born, Greek was the lingua franca, or the, the language of commerce in those days. So even if we came from different countries, we could communicate. Why? We, because we speak Greek. When the apostle Paul went around and he preached, he could preach in the Greek language and everyone will understand no matter what nation he, he goes to. When he wrote the New Testament, the New Testament is written in the language that everyone could read. It was written in Greek. That's why if you go to seminary, one of the the languages that you have to learn is you have to learn Greek. And it was so important that God prepared the foundation for the gospel to spread out by having a unified language. And he used this man, Alexander the Great, to spread the Greek culture. When Rome took over and Rome was in power, Jesus was born under Rome. But Rome decided to keep the Greek culture so that Greek was still the language. But why was Rome important? Rome was important because it created peace in the empire. So that the missionaries, missionaries like Paul, missionaries like Barnabas, they could travel in relative peace. And that's why they call it the Pax Romana, the peace that comes from Rome. And the, the roads were built, the infrastructure were, was built, so that they could travel fairly quickly and fairly safely throughout the kingdom. You know, you hear that statement, all roads lead to Rome. And that's part of the reason. That's why it says in Galatians 4.29, at this time, just at the right time, Jesus was born. But God was preparing the way not only for Messiah to be born. God was preparing the way for the gospel to spread quickly, and he was doing this by controlling kings and kingdoms that would come. Here in this passage, we see that God controlled the circumstances that affected the gospel. We see the preparation for the way of the gospel. Secondly, we see the prediction concerning the wars of the generals. God gives Daniel detailed prophecies concerning kings and rulers that would come. And God was in control over the continuing battles between the Seleucid Empire and the Ptolemy Empire. Now, here's what's interesting. So the, the kingdoms of the Ptolemies and Seleucus, the Seleucids, uh, they, they kept fighting. They kept attacking each other. The one in the south, the one in the north. And guess who was in between? Israel. And it's amazing to me, not only that God could predict all the wars that would happen, it's amazing to me that Israel was kept safe through this. In spite of all the trials and the tribulation, Israel wasn't wiped out. Now, the only way I could illustrate this, how many of you saw the the fight between Thurman and, and, and Pacquiao? Keith Thurman and Manny Pacquiao, you guys saw that? Or you heard about it? Now, let me ask you this. If instead of being on the ringside, you stood right in the middle of them, how long do you think you'll survive? Not very long, right? I mean, you just kept standing in the middle while they were fighting. You get knocked out. And and it's amazing to me that Israel, in spite of standing in the middle of these two powers, didn't get knocked out. They should have been wiped out. But they remain a nation. Why? Because God was in control. Uh, And and verse 6 to verse 20 describes these fights. And I guess you could describe it in, in, in four, big, uh, four big fights. But these are, the, these are the kings or the generals that were fighting. One is Ptolemy the first and Seleucus the first. That's in verse 5. Uh, Seleucus was mightier than, 
uh, Ptolemy, but it was his alliance with the south that enabled him to consolidate the empire. Uh, the, second, the, the, the second verse, or the, the next uh, fight uh, in verse 6, was between uh, Ptolemy II and Antiochus II. And, and what, what stands out about this, this fight is that, or the, these two kings, is that they try to form an alliance through marriage. So Ptolemy II had a daughter named uh, Ber- Berenice, I think is that how you pronounce it? But, Anti- but Antiochus was already married. So he had to divorce his wife to marry the daughter of Ptolemy II. Ptolemy died uh, after a couple of years, so he took back his first wife. He took back the wife he was divorced. Uh, she wasn't having it. You know what she did? She murdered both her husband, her ex-husband, and the, the Berenice. So it was like a <laughs> disaster, just total disaster. Now, that's important because her brother, Ptolemy III, wanted to take revenge. So he attacks the north and conquers the north. So that's part of it. That's verse 7 to verse 9. Now, I'm just summarizing, oversimplifying all the things that are, are there, but just for you to get an idea. Um, Ptolemy the, the fourth and Antiochus the third. what's significant about this is at this point, now this is a span, of, um, this spans over 150 years of history. At this point, Rome was rising in power and was beginning to influence, was beginning to uh, subjugate um, rulers. And so Antiochus III wanted to give or had to give tribute to Rome. And how, how would he do it? Well, by taking money from Israel. But what's interesting is while he was doing this, he died. It says in verse 20. So we're going to skip all the way down to verse 20. I just summarized 15 verses for you. Um, But in verse 20, it says, Then shall arise in this place one who shall send an an exactor of tribute. Uh, He wanted to tax Israel, want to get money from Israel. For the glory of the kingdom, but within a few days he shall be broken, neither in anger nor in battle. What's interesting is that he, this came true. He was poisoned. What's significant about that is it opens up the way for this guy that we've seen before named Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, Daniel, uh, the book of Daniel, a, a good commentary if you want a, a classic, is John Walbert's Daniel, the Key to Prophetic Revelation. If you look at those 15 verses, if you look at those verses that I mentioned, What is encouraging to me and what should be encouraging to you is how accurately the Bible is fulfilled. Because the amazing detailed prophecies of Daniel 11, 1 to 35, contain approximately 135 prophetic statements that have all now been fulfilled. These verses serve as an impressive introduction to the events that are yet future. How how do we know that when the Bible says Jesus is coming again, that it's going to come true? Because all the other prophecies have come true. That we serve a God who's eternal, who knows everything. He's been to the future and back. That's why he could tell us what's coming up. But not only that, not only does he see, he controls everything. He is sovereign over all. You cannot predict the future accurately if you do not control the events completely. No, just knowing a few things about the future and, and making a good guess, it's not going to come up with 100% accuracy. Um, let me give you an example. Okay, so It's very difficult to predict the future. Even sometimes when you think it's a sure thing, it's still not because you don't see all the events that happen. You, have, you don't have control. Let me give you an example. The Warriors, how many of you thought they were going to win the championship last year? Not just you, every single um, expert said, oh yeah, sure thing, especially when they got DeMarcus Cousins. Who knew that DeMarcus Cousins was going to get hurt in the playoff? Who knew that Kevin Durant was going to get hurt? Who knew that in the sixth game, Clay Thompson was going to tear his ACL? We didn't know that. So people who bet on the Warriors, guess what? They lost. Why? Because they can't predict everything that will happen. So that's why it's called gambling, because even if you're skillful at it, guess what? You can't control the roll of the dice. You can't predict and control the the turn of the car on the river. You you, you can't. 
That's why even if, even if you're skilled, even if you're good at it, even if you're smart, guess what? You still go broke. You still lose. God never loses. You know why? Because he knows exactly what's going to happen, and he controls the events that will take place. That should give you great comfort. That should comfort you knowing that whatever the events are, no matter what the chaos is that's happening that Brother Armando mentioned earlier, no matter what trials you're going through in life, understand that God loves you and that he is in control. And that he is working things out not only for your good, but for his glory. Battles always for the glory of God. Here in, this, in, in Isaiah, it reminds us that God is in full control of everything. It says, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. What is it that separates God from all the false gods? He says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done. In other words, God knows everything that will happen even before it happens. And it says, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Why is it that he could tell the future? Because he controls everything. My counsel stands. I will accomplish all my purpose. Now, what's interesting about this is this, that he is totally sovereign, totally in control, and yet does so in a way that doesn't take away your human responsibility. In other words, just because God is in control doesn't mean he's responsible for your sin. That's why it says in Galatians 6, 7, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. Whatever you sow, you will reap. Now, I know some of you are thinking, Pastor, how does that work? How does God's complete control in my, my responsibility, how, how does that work? I don't know. <laughs> Go ask Pastor Al <laughs> and Pastor Eric. They just graduated from seminary, so that should still be fresh. No, but honestly, it's one of those things that we're just going to have to ask God in the future. Because both truths are, are written in the Bible. God's in completely sovereign, and that God still holds us accountable. God still holds us accountable. All right, third one. That, that's not part of the message, that's a bonus. Uh, so he prepares the way for the gospel. He predicts the wars of the generals. Finally, he punishes the worship of false gods. He punishes the worship of false gods. He, he controls even, even the most powerful kings, even the ones that will control the world in the future, the one that will control the world in the future, the Antichrist. He is sovereign over them. In verse 21... So just to, to keep you, bring us back up to date, the Medo-Persian Empire taken over by the Greek Empire. The Greek Empire divided into four. Those four, the two of them, the, the Seleuc Seleucids in the north and the, the kingdom of the, um, Ptolemy in the south, they kept fighting. Out of the kingdom of the north, there was one who came. His name is Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, this relatively minor king is important. He's important because he takes his revenge out on Israel. At this point, Rome was in power. Rome says, no, 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 don't, don't attack. Don't attack the south. And he wanted so badly to attack the south. And so he goes back up. And on his way back up to the north, he takes out his frustration on Israel. What does he do? He stops them from worshiping. He sets up the he sets up the, the idol of Zeus in the temple, and he sacrifices a pig on the altar. He desecrates the temple. It says, in this place shall arise a contemptible person. And there's a lot of verses dedicated to this relatively minor king because of what he did to the people of Israel. He is a contemptible person. He calls himself Antiochus Epiphanes. The word Epiphanes means the glorious one. What's the battle always about? glory. But according to Gabriel, he is a contemptible or vile or evil person. Why is that? Because in verse 31, it says, forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offering, and they shall set up the abomination that makes 
desolation. He desecrates the temple. Jesus speaks of this, and he speaks of it in the future. So this happened about a hundred and over a hundred years before Jesus came. But when Jesus came and he was predicting the future, he talks about a future abomination of desolation. In verse 35, and some of the wise shall stumble so they shall be refined and purified and made white until the time of the end, for it still awaits the appointed time. So here, just like when we first studied about Antiochus Epiphanes, it shows that there's coming a time in the end. And this, this phrase, the time of the end, that I believe is, is speaking of the last seven years in that 490 years. It's speaking of the tribulation period. It's speaking of yet another one who will desecrate the temple in Israel. So one of the prophetic things that we need to look out for is the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. We'll talk more about about that next week. Okay, verse 40, again, at the time of the end. He says, the king of the south shall attack him, but the king of the north shall rush upon him. So at this point, there, there are other countries that are in play. And as Gabriel points to the time of the end, we'll talk about some of the possibilities of who those countries might be. It says in verse 45, And he shall pitch his palatial palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. Just like Antiochus Epiphanes, the defeat of the Antichrist will not be by earthly, earthly armies. Or dictators. It shall come directly from God. And we'll talk about that next week. And we're going to learn more about that. Come back next week. Uh, But here, what is what is it that we see? God in control of history. Uh, He prepares the way for the gospel so that the Greek language is spoken, so that Roman peace is experienced, so that the so that The the missionaries of the first century church was able to spread the gospel throughout the known world. The wars, he predicts the wars of the general. We see God who who not only sees in detail everything that will happen in the future, we see God who, who controls. He not only sees, he's sovereign. And that's why we could entrust our lives to him. That's why we don't have to panic when things seem to be going awry. Why? Because God is seated on the throne. And if he could control the fate of empires, he could control our lives. He can control our history. And then the, the worship, the punishment, uh, he, he punishes the worship of false gods, both of Antiochus Epiphanes, who died of insanity, and of the Antichrist. And we'll talk about Revelations 19 next week, a little bit of it next week. And we see God who, who will not share his glory with another, these so-called dictators and and world leaders who, who demand worship, God, God's the one who puts them down. I will not share my glory with another. I give God all the glory for his control over history and his compassion and preparing the gospel. I was reading a book, uh, this, this whole thing on God's sovereignty and, and man's uh, free will. I just had to read some more theological books. And there's one that I started to read, a beautiful book called The Potter's Promise. And this sentence just struck me, and I was in awe, and I just wanted to share it with you. It says, I now believe that the scriptures reveal a potter. And this is, of course, from, taken from Romans chapter 9. And I now believe that scriptures reveal a potter who manifests his glory by sacrificing himself for the undeserving vessels. Not by making vessels undeserving from birth so as to condemn them to display his glory. And then this is the sentence that that just blew me away. So I came to realize that God is most glorified, not at the expense of his creation, but at the expense of himself for the sake of his creation. When we see God's control over, over the kingdoms of this world, What gives him the most glory is not that he is all-powerful, not that he's sovereign. What gives him the most glory is that in his sovereignty, he uses that ultimate power to prepare the Savior, to prepare the gospel so that you and I can be saved. In order for Messiah to save us, he had to sacrifice himself on the cross. That's why he says, I came to realize that God is most glorified, not at the expense of his creation, 
but the expense of himself for the sake of his creation. It cost the father his son. It cost the son his life so that he could give us salvation freely. Romans 3.23, if, if you've come here and if you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, the reason Jesus came is because of sin. But let me just submit to you that sin is not what you think it is. Because it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. See, when we think of sin, we think of what? Doing bad things. But even doing good things, when it's not done for the glory of God, is sin. So it's not just what you do. It's your motive behind it. You could be doing a great thing. But if it's done to glorify yourself, if it's done for self and uh, for, for, your, for your benefit so that you will receive fame, so that you will receive power, guess what? The Bible calls it sin. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's why the Bible says that the moment you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are now under new, a new mission statement. And here's your mission statement. Let's read it together. Okay? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. What is sin? It is failing to show God off. It is failing to give him the credit that is due his name. The moment you become a Christian, the Bible says, now your mission statement, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, whether you work, whether you play basketball, whether you go to school, whether you're a nurse, you're an accountant, says you do all these things for what? The glory of God. Whatever we do, it's to point glory to God. Why do we celebrate our 30th year anniversary? For the glory of God. So that God is ultimately glorified. Let me end with this. Oh, two more verses. 2 Thessalonians 2.14, which is amazing to me. And as I was studying this whole topic, God will not share the, the glory of worship. God will not give to you credit that belongs only to him. But there is a glory that he shares with those who would put their faith in him as Lord and Savior. And it's found in 2 Thessalonians 2.14. Let's read this together. He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? God in his sovereignty says, I I will not share my glory with another. And he prepares the gospel so that when you receive the gospel, he could share with you the glory that is found. In the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm blown away by this topic. I read that and I go, wow. Amazing, Lord. That you would sacrifice yourself. So that I can be saved. And one of these days. One of these days. With this verse I'll end. All the battle in the heavenlies. And all the battle on earth will cease. Because it says in Habakkuk 2.14. It predicts a time where it says. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. One of these days, the battle for glory will be over. There will be no more battle in the heavenlies. There will be no more battle on earth. And on that day, God and God alone will be worshipped and glorified. Amen. Let's pray. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, if today you've come and God is calling you to himself. I invite you to respond to the gospel. God will not share his glory, the the glory of worship, but God will share the glory of Christ with you if you would accept the gospel, if you would put your faith in Jesus as Savior. So in the quietness of this moment, if God has spoken to you, I invite you to come to him and And receive Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior. And if that's your desire, would you follow me in a simple prayer, just quietly where you're at. Just say, dear Lord Jesus, I need you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. Was buried and the third day rose again. I here and now put my faith in you alone. As my Lord and as my Savior. 
Thank you for your gift of eternal life. Father, I thank you for anyone who's prayed that prayer. I pray, Father, that you would just become more and more real to him or to her and that they would grow in their relationship with you. Maybe you're a believer, but there are things in your life that are not glorifying to God. I want to give you an an opportunity just to confess that before the Lord. The God who loves you fully, who knows you fully, and yet loves you unconditionally. And so give me an opportunity to do that, to do business with God. Just say, ask for forgiveness. Lord, forgive me for I have not glorified you in whatever it is. Only you and God knows what it is. But just say, Lord, through the help of your Holy Spirit who indwells me, Lord, help me once again to glorify you in my life, to glorify you in my relationship, to glorify you at work, at school, my free time, my hobbies, my family. Lord, in all these things, Lord, would you change my heart? Would you work in me once again so that I may bring glory to you? Father, you've heard the prayers of your children, and I pray, Father, that you would continue to work in our lives. We love you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all rise and let's sing our closing.